my pleasure to introduce the, our next speaker, uh, who uh, is uh, someone who has uh, been uh, in the, uh, what can we say, in the orbit of the uh, network for a, a long time, and who, when I alluded to earlier the fact that we're very proud that there are uh, people whose careers uh, have been in some ways fostered and encouraged by the activities of the network is a great example of that. So Amy Bombay uh, is, um, uh, I can read a little bit from here, I guess, is a member of the Rainy River First Nation and is uh, currently, well, has finished now, no, or you're still finishing? I'm, I'm on my way to Halifax right now. On her way to Halifax, <laughs> from Ottawa to Halifax, where she's taking up a position as, uh, as professor at uh, 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 Dalhousie. And so she is fully launched, uh, but along the way has produced really some of the best work to date, uh, tracing the links uh, between uh, residential school exposure and the impact on individuals and on their descendants. So we're just delighted to have you here. Okay, so um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, a recent qualitative study that I did for the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. Um, in which we began to explore um, reports of student-to-student -student abuse that happened in residential school. Um, I think we all are aware that there was uh, widespread abuse from uh, the staff and, and priests that work at these schools. But um, as I'll be talking about, there's been more recently stories of student-to-student -student abuse, and people are just don't really know how to um, deal with it and how to approach this issue. So uh, the Healing Foundation uh, wanted us to explore this issue. So while some, although some of our other research suggests that too many non-Aboriginal Canadians hold the view that Aboriginal people should just get over uh, what they've suffered at residential school, our previous work uh, looking at the intergenerational transmission of residential school trauma has provided important empirical evidence that the residential school system continues to significantly impact um, individuals whose families have been affected. Uh, and this is those who did not go to residential school. So as you can, and this data is from the um, First Nations Regional Health Survey. So it's a representative sample of First Nations on reserve. So as you can see, um, those who had no previous generations who went to residential school reported lo the lowest levels of psychological distress. Those who had a parent or a grandparent, so one previous generation who attended, were at greater risk. And those who had a parent and a grandparent, so two generations in their family who attended, were at the greatest risk. So, you know, we're really seeing these strong empirical links uh, that residential school um, puts individuals at risk. Um, so as we all know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has provided a forum for survivors to share their stories over the last um, several years. And in line with the general dialogue surrounding residential schools, uh, most of these stories were about abuse by school staff. Um, but it was also, I think, the first time that we really started to hear about stories of abuse between students. Uh, so as we just heard, um, all survivors were eligible for monetary compensation, and those who endured physical or sexual abuse were invited to apply for additional compensation through the independent assessment process. Because the IAP required survivors to give detailed accounts of their abuses, uh, including they were asked to name their perpetrators, um, more accounts of abuse be uh, between students began being covered and discussed in the media. Uh, and for the most part, it was described as unanticipated, unexpected, and bizarre. And I think because the focus, and this is because the focus of the discourse surrounding residential schools has really been focused on abuse by priests and staff. Um, so the alleged perpetrators in the ind independent assessment process uh, were referred to as persons of interest or POIs, uh, who were then notified and that they had been named as an abuser by this specific claimant. Um, who were told, uh, and then they were then invited to give their account of what happened at the IAP. So I'm not really going to get into that today, but of course our service providers that we interviewed for this study expressed a great concern over how this, over this process and how it affected those who were asked to name their perpetrators, those who were named by other perpetrators, I mean by other survivors. Um, so that's in the report, but I'm not really talking about that today. So because of um, the various concerns over the IAP 
process and concerns that this issue might be used to perhaps blame Aboriginal peoples uh, for their current health and social problems, you know, things, saying things like they did it to themselves. Um, the Aboriginal Healing Foundation approached us to carry out this exploratory study um, looking at a few different questions. Um, so again, I won't be getting into this too much today, but first we conducted a review of the mainstream literature relating to factors that contribute to different types of peer abuse in childhood. And we also spoke to service providers about their opinions about the specific factors that led to, uh, to peer abuse in residential schools. Um, and this included uh, priests rewarding certain behaviors to abuse other students uh, and bullying that occurred between students in order to get more food simply because they were hungry. Um, I think what both the literature review and the service provider responses convincingly reveal is that this phenomenon should not be ex uh, considered abnormal, uh, but is in fact really should, should be the expected outcome um, considering when we consider the context surrounding residential schools and the conditions that these children lived in. Um, we also asked service providers about their perceptions of whether there seems to be differential effects of having been abused by students and staff, as well as about the effects on those who perpetrated against others and about the collective effects on communities. But this morning, I, I'm really going to be focusing on some of the eff effects on the victims who were abused by other students and on the collective effects in communities and how this has really seemed to um, affected relationships between people and uh, between whole communities. So of the 43 service providers that we interviewed, 44 had worked with over 100 survivors and over half were Aboriginal, of whom uh, over half had either attended residential school themselves or had a, a loved one or a family member who attended. Um, so many of these uh, individuals also drew, drew from their personal experiences as well. So just to give you a better idea of what we're talking about here, um, and we really didn't have any, any idea of this, re of how prevalent it was going to be when we first went into the study, but 70% of our service providers felt that student-to-student -student abuse was a frequent occurrence. Um, of the, our 19 participants who had worked with over 100 survivors, um, all heard about staff abuse from their clients, as we expected, uh, but they also reported that they heard about student-to-student -student abuse just as much um, as staff abuse. Uh, but to be more specific, it was typically the physical and emotional abuse that appeared to have been pervasive and occurring on a daily basis. Uh, and this was typically when it, within the context of bullying, which has been shown in other populations to be uh, very um, common and uh, in residential settings uh, where, where students are all living together. Um, the... It was also noted that bullying uh, was sometimes per perpetrated by groupings of students that were sometimes formed on the basis of cultural differences and community rivalries when uh, different uh, communities were sent to the same residential school. Sexual abuse uh, between students was not described as having been a daily occurrence for all students, but it was not uncommon either. So in exploring the differences in the effects of being abused by staff versus by other students, um, there were five interrelated themes identified in the service providers' responses. These included differences in emotional responses, differences in memories of abuse and the willingness of survivors to talk about uh, being abused by other students, um, as well as uh, effects on general well-being, which were often perceived as being worse for those abused by other students, uh, because once these children left a residential school, they were all just sent back to their communities, so many continued to live in their, the same community as their perpetrator, per perpetrators for their whole life. One of the other perceived differences by those abused by staff versus students that I'd like to focus on today uh, is on the differences in the effects on trust and social relationships. This is actually a quote um, from one of our participants who spoke about his own victimization by another student at a residential school. At the time, it wasn't obvious, of course, but when I think back, there was an in inability to trust anyone after that, even my own people. I remember as a child thinking I should feel safer with my own kind. 
I remember I felt angry at the adults, the white man, but then also feeling, how can this happen from my own kind? More of a letdown feeling. Uh, and just in relation to that, um, some of our participants uh, who were psychologists described uh, this in terms of betrayal trauma, uh, suggesting that being abused by an in-group member uh, or someone who they expected to trust are more vulnerable to the negative outcomes associated with this abuse. So similarly, uh, another participant indicated that those who were abused by staff, they didn't trust the old white men, but those who were abused by nuns, they didn't trust them either. And those that were abused by older students, they didn't trust them either. So by the time they were abused by everyone, they didn't trust anyone. And this was described by our service providers to have continued throughout the lives of, our, uh, of uh, their clients. Uh, so they couldn't trust non-Aboriginal peoples, but they also had trouble uh, trusting members of their own group. So um, i just like, uh, yes to point out uh, that this is exactly what we were hearing from many adult children of residential school so survivors in some of our other studies uh, and when we, were, when we were focusing on the intergenerational effects of residential schools. As many residential school offspring recalled getting explicit me messages from their parents telling them not to trust non-Aboriginal peoples, but at the same time receiving similarly negative messages about Aboriginal people. So this is a quote from a participant whose um, dad went to residential school. That we asked them if their parents ever spoke to them about issues related to their identity or about being uh, an Aboriginal person. No, my dad just told me that people did not like Indian children and that we should not trust white people. At the same time, he told us that Indian people were useless and stupid. He said that we should not be like most Indians and go on welfare. A lot of mixed messages. So respondents also spoke about differential effects on identity, such that those who were abused by other Aboriginal students uh, were more likely to feel confused or ashamed of their Aboriginal identity. Uh, this service provider described that I have people that are experiencing internalized racism. They are prejudiced against themselves. Again, um, just to go back and uh, show you how we've been finding this kind of same theme uh, in our intergenerational studies. Uh, we reported, uh, we heard reports of internalized stigma and racism uh, from residential school offspring, as many described observing their parents' shame while growing up, which in turn affected their feelings about their Aboriginal identity. For example, one of our residential school offspring um, described how my mother was taught to be ashamed of her Aboriginal identity. This caused her to struggle for some sense of, sense of belonging. She even talked down about Aboriginal people because of their misfortunes. As a kid, I remember being ashamed when my mother came to school because I was often called names such as Red Wagon Burner and Savage. Today, I'm so ashamed of the shame I experienced as a child, and I'm so angry that my parents never taught me to be proud of who I was. So considering that several generations of Aboriginal children went to residential school and that the effects of residential schools continue through generations that did not attend themselves, I think it's not surprising that these individual effects can be seen at the collective community level, uh, as, such as in the numerous health and social disparities that, uh, we, that we see relative to the non-Aboriginal population in Canada. And indeed, research in other groups that have faced um, similar collective traumas uh, suggest that the effects of these group-based traumas are greater than the sum of the effects on individuals, as collectively experienced trauma has been shown to modify social norms, dynamics, processes, uh, structures, and functioning and relationships. So indeed, the service providers that we um, interviewed described how the lack of individual level trust and a loss in culture and traditional norms and a loss of pride in their culture um, has resulted in poor relationships in communities affected by um, residential schools and has resulted in lateral violence. Um, as one service provider said, family, feud uh, family feuding, fighting and hating. It is very common. This is much there is much violence practice, unhealthy living, broken families, lies told, and no trust. Another uh, part participant said, we are dealing with family dysfunction, family fights in different parts of the community, and so on. Why is that? 
Why do we as Aboriginal people tend to be mean to one another? Whether it's lateral violence, gossip, rumor, backstabbing, and even outright anger, sometimes leading to deaths, violent deaths. Why is that? I think you can make linkages to what we've been talking about. So participants also attributed uh, much of the continued sexual abuse and uh, violence that exists in some, com some communities um, to the normalization of these behaviors. I think what is important to ask is how many abusers, being students, went home into, into the community thinking because they were allowed at residential school that they conti could continue abusing their loved ones at home and how this cycle of hurting one another has been passed on for generations. Bullying was also described to be common in communities affected by residential schools. Um, this service provider shared that it was the bully system that pervades the reserve still. The chief came into our staff meeting with a shotgun and set it on the table. It was definitely a bully system among the children and the adults. So the other collective effects um, that service providers spoke of, about included effects on community leadership as it seemed that many who were abusers or bullies in residential school tended to seek out positions of power in communities. Um, and many, uh, and also in addition to those people, there was uh, described to be leaders who had not healed from their own residential school experiences and that kind of impeded the healing of others in the community. Um, also, uh, reflecting stories shared to us by children of residential school students in our other stories, I mean, sorry, in our other studies, uh, in many families and communities, the continued silence surrounding residential schools and silence regarding the contemporary effects of residential schools and other historical traumas, um, such as the high rates of violence and abuse in, in some communities, was perceived as being a major impediment uh, to healing and to moving forward. So this report uh, is just about to be released next month. So now I'm trying to figure out what my next step should be um, in terms of addressing some of the contemporary and long-term effects of residential schools um, and, and of student-to-student -student abuse specifically. So I invite any suggestions as I, I'm a bit worried going forward in this work because uh, I know in Australia the, there was the, their justice, Aboriginal Justice Commissioner brought lateral violence to the forefront and he received a lot of kind of negative um, you know feedback saying that he was he was blaming his own people which he really wasn't doing and I'm not doing and I'm trying to show that it's uh, it, it's these effects stem from the past and from things that were done to Aboriginal peoples. Um, I'm thinking that I'd like to develop and evaluate some kind of mix of individual and collect collective level inter, uh, interventions to address issues related to lateral violence and community level bullying. And that also provides a safe space for survivors to continue to share their stories and for the next generation to learn about residential schools and other um, historical traumas faced by their uh, families. And I'm also interested uh, to see first whether perceived in-group rejection, so rejection from other Aboriginal peoples, affects mental health in the same way as perceived discrimination. Um, as we've found strong relationships between perceived discrimination and various mental health outcomes in First Nations and other Aboriginal groups. And whether increasing cultural pride can reduce or buffer uh, against the negative effect of perceived discrimination. Uh, as you can see in the top left graph, that's exactly what we found in a sample of First Nations adults. Those who had high levels of in-group affect, so by the solid line, they were less affected by residential schools, so it really seemed to protect them. Um, this idea is also supported by our work, um, our work with adult children of residential school offspring, as those who reported having reclaimed their identity uh, and, rep and reported feeling more proud of uh, their heritage, also tended to report improved well-being and, and more hope for the future. This uh, participant's mother went to residential school. I was ashamed growing up, but I've since reclaimed my identity. Now that I'm on my own, I have more pride and I'm learning to love my identity. I gave my son a traditional Ojibwe name and I vow to raise him to be proud of who he is.